did my extended essay over optical illusion. So I formulated my research question based on like my interest in the visual arts. So I went over at least like 15 different op not op art movements, but um, art movements in general. And then I chose the one that I wanted to experiment with the most and the one that was most interesting to me. So eventually I decided that I was going to do optical illusory arts, which is it's really, really complicated, which is why I wanted to go into depth in it, because it's also related to my uh, IB art class. And since we get to do investigational workbooks, I also have to experiment with other types of styles. So I just wanted to like be really comprehensive of the art art person. So eventually I made the question, which is right here. It says, how does the human eye perceive optical illusory art and what determines if illusory art is successful or unsuccessful to the public's eye? So this is pretty much like the first part of it. This is the science behind how optical illusions work, which is really complicated, but I also wanted to find out how it works too, because I'm also a scientist and I see what happens. But, um, and then the second part of it is just criticisms of the artworks that were generated during that time. So originally I went to Rice University and then I researched and I got about 20 different sources, but out of all of those, only about 10 of them were related to my piece or what I was going to do. So then I also had to look up YouTube videos about uh, an exhibit that was used during this time since the, there was no actual documentation of it. It was just, it's like a well-known thing. It was called The Responsive Eye. And there was a document, not documentation, documentary over it that was about five minutes long. So I watched that on YouTube to also get some of my sources. And considering most of the experts in op art are dead, I couldn't really directly get their advice. So I had to just pretty much make inferences on all of their, uh, the novels that they wrote and all their experience. And my main sources of research were about uh, how the eye perceives optical illusory art, since that was, it was more comprehensive than the, how how successful it was or how to criticize a piece like that. So after I researched about, I think it was six or seven different books just over the process of it, like the workings of the eye and like which muscles in the eye uh, are used and whatnot. So I used that to, determine, to answer the first part of my question. And then I s studied about two books for the criticism part of op art, which is really complicated. And that was probably my hardest part to do during this in entire investigation because there weren't really that many criticisms of it, or there weren't really like public figures that were had enough authority to give criticisms over op art. So since I only found about two of them, it was mostly just Bridget Riley criticizing herself, and then there was another person who they weren't really that influential, but they were kind of like the only source that I had. So that's what I had to use. And then in order to pretty much give a comprehensive research over it. I also did a history on op art so people can un understand like the context, like where it came from and whatnot. And so that's pretty much just helps like the reader understand where my inv investigation is leading to. And then let's see, so I have to go through the history. So the history, the first instances of optical illusion were the Byzantine Empire and then they used tessere, which were little cubes of glazed color blocks? No, little cubes of glazed color. And it would arrange them in a wall in a way to make it look like it was actually a 3D art form, like a god sketching out of the wall or some kind of scene, but it was actually just a flat surface. So it made it seem like it was a 3D image, which I thought was pretty interesting considering like they didn't really have to do that. So I was wondering where they got their um, ingenuity for that. But uh, the second was a scientist named Goeth, and he was pretty much researched everything about light and how the eye perceives light, which was pretty advanced for people in that age, because that was the, about in 1810 when he did that research. And then there was also the Renaissance was dedicated to realism, which also contributed to that, because they used um, Goeth's uh, laws of like how the eye perceives light to paint paintings and make them look realistic, which is pretty much an illusion, because even though it's just a flat 2D image, it looks like a real picture. And then there were also other scientists called Chevrolet, Blanc, and Rude, and they also established laws such as the law of sim simultaneous contrast, which is when um, two different colors next to each other make like colors look different shades than what they actually are. So if you had like a white next to a red, it would make it look lighter than a black next to a red. And then, then there was also the arrangements of dots, and like the closer dots appeared, it made the colors blend together. 
So from far away, they they would have like red and yellow dots, and then they would place them next to each other, and like the further you stepped back, it looked like it was orange in color. So that was the next skull that was established. And then Impressionists also developed upon this, such as Cezanne and uh, Monet and Turner. And they developed a pointillism, which is what this piece is by. And this is Weekend House by Sigmar Polk. And you can't really see it from where you are, but like there are these like, thousands and thousands of tiny little dots. And from far away, it looks like a singular image, but none of the dots are actually connected. It just looks like it, which is part of the assimilation of dots, which was um, one of the first laws of art. The next movement was pop art, and that also contributed because it developed upon pointillism. And then artists such as Roy Lichtenstein and others, they used pointillism to like, and simultaneous contrast to make an ob ob object appear to um, be brighter than it was. And then he's just actually like a simple yellow, and this is simple red, and these are all tiny little squares of color. So it makes, from far away, it makes the object appear as a solid color, but it's not really. This was just, um, let's see. Oh, this is the next part. It's um, British and op art movement, which was in the 1960s, which again was established with the, um, okay, it was established with the exhibit of the responsive eye. And then this was just a Hallmark card, which obviously wasn't from that far ago, from that long ago, but it was just um, based on a concept called Rabbit or Duck, which is basically a picture of a rabbit, which is, this one is cartoonish, but in the real one it's, um, a sketching of a rabbit, but that if you turn it sideways, it also looks like a duck, which is in this one. So it was an interesting concept, and people began to like use that and other kind of concepts, such as pointillism and um, simultaneous contrast, to make even more sh and to make stronger illusions, which is where Bridget Riley also developed um, her artistic. And so Bridget Riley was a main person, but then this one is also this person. I can't say that name. Which is Hard, but um, he also contributed a lot to the op art, the op art movement because this is in the 1960s, like 1963 and 4. And he created pieces with just like work, which if you focus on the center, then it uh, all the dots appear to be like fluctuating and whatnot. And then the closer you get, it seems to zoom in, and the farther away you get, it seems to zoom out. And then he also made another one. He used simultaneous contrast of light and dark colors. And then if you just stare at like one point, it seems like in your peripheral vision that other things are moving, but it's all, it's a uh, flat piece. Okay, so then that was pretty much after all those pieces and analyzing those, I had a comprehensive history of how op art came to be so that you would understand the context of like how it was criticized and whatnot. And then the science behind it is pretty much like half of my essay, which is highly complicated, but in essence it is when the rods and the cones in your eye, they um, focus on different parts, like light and darks. So if your like, cones are more active than your rods, or if they're like on equal activity levels, then it'll confuse your eye, and that'll make you see patterns of kinetic movement that aren't really there. So this is pretty much like an example of kinetic movement. Like if your eye focuses on this, like your rod cells in your eye will focus on the light, and the, um, the cone cells will so focus on the black, which will also like confuse your eye, and it'll cause equiluminescence, which will then make your eye just do funny things and will make it appear to be different things. And then there were other examples of scientific laws, but it's pretty much like assimilation of colors that are similar and then also like simultaneous contrast like earlier. And then after I went over all of the scientific methods, I also went and did, uh, researched the criticisms. And pretty much anything that like had a deeper meaning to it was considered to be successful, but anything that was just like plainly made to trick the eye and it had no other purpose, it was considered as an unsuccessful piece because um, real artists were real artists technically didn't like the, um, the fact that there was no meaning behind it and there's no artistic influence behind it. So then after all of that, I was able to answer the question of how the eye perceives optical illusory art and I was also able to determine if an op art piece was successful or unsuccessful to the public's eyes.